It is often said that a national park system is America's best idea. In 1903, Teddy Roosevelt stood on the rim of this landscape before it was protected, and he lobbied to the American people. And he said, leave it as it is. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. I've worked as a photographer and a filmmaker for a long time, a lot of it in this place. And I was curious how we're passing forward this ideal, this concept. Are we actually bridging from one generation to the next? Are we actually leaving it as it is? So as a way to explore this idea, I decided to literally take a walk in the park, our most iconic national park, Grand Canyon. I chose my good friend and author, Kevin Fedarko, and I somehow convinced him to sign up for this project. We did an assignment for National Geographic magazine, and we wanted to do a transect from east to west through the entire park. Now, Kevin was very reluctant to do this because he knew firsthand a little bit about this place. In stretches, it is 18 miles wide, and it is 6,000 feet deep. You could stack five Empire State Buildings inside of it on top of each other. If you follow the main highway through the river, it's 277 miles long, but if you decide to walk and go up and down all the drainages, it's more like 750 miles. And to move through this landscape, this broken, fractured world full of geologic time that dates back 1.7 billion years old, in order to move horizontally, you have to move vertically up into the puzzles of rock and time. And when you do, you, of course, have to return back down to find either your root or water, or in our case, sometimes food, which we'd cached strategically along the river. You can't follow the river because it's basically cliffed out. And then when you add the temperature, which would often swell early in our project up to 108 degrees at night, you quickly realize that you're getting into something that few people can really enjoy or handle. And on about day three or day four, maybe even day five as well, maybe every day of the project, this is pretty much how you look after breakfast. <laughs> I now knew why Kevin was reluctant to join me. I also started to quickly understand firsthand why more people have stood on the surface of the moon than have completed a consecutive through hike through this landscape. And if the anguish and the, just the, oh gosh, I'm never gonna finish, what are we doing here project, um, look on my face doesn't shine through, well you can see it on our feet. First the soles of our shoes delaminated, then our feet followed, and then our bodies soon thereafter, because you can't carry enough weight of food through this to move efficiently. Uh, we carried roughly two pounds, that translates to 2,000 calories. We were burning on upwards of 5,000, moving on average 15 miles a day. We quickly failed. We quickly left. I didn't want to go back to this place. I was shattered. And then we were reminded by the community that lives around this place that this is an important story because it wasn't about our physical challenges doing that. We could get over that, we could figure that out. It was about highlighting the challenges that this landscape is now facing, which is ringing it on all four sides of the compass. So we kept moving with the help of friends. We moved down and hiked up at this place, roughly 120 miles in, and met Renee Yellowhorse. Renee is a Navajo woman who grew up on the rim, the south rim, on Navajo Nation land that butts up to Grand Canyon National Park. And she's concerned about the future of this landscape as much as anybody because she sees it's changing. She's rallied a small number of Navajo, predominantly women, of which most of them don't speak English, to create a larger voice for their concern because they're afraid that this place, their Sistine Chapel, called the Confluence, where the Little Colorado joins the main stem of the Colorado River, is potentially going to turn into what she calls an amusement park. There is a developer that has proposed an idea to do a tram on Navajo land, promising jobs and opportunity for the Navajo people. He's not Navajo. 
It would bring up to 10,000 people a day to the confluence on the border of the national park. Renee and her group at Save the Confluence are extremely worried that this is going to drastically change this remarkable place. It's not going to leave it as it is. To give you an idea, there's 26,000 people that are permitted to go through Grand Canyon National Park by the river a year. In three days, this would eclipse that number. I'll come back to Renee later, because Kevin and I kept moving through the seasons, and we actually passed under the south rim of Grand Canyon National Park, which if you've been, most likely you've come here. Six million visitors come here, which actually does provide remarkable access. Uh, if you don't like hiking, I don't particularly like hiking, to be honest. Uh, or if you're even handicapped, there are a variety of ways. You can ride a mule, you can ride a boat, you can hike, you can sit on the rim here. There's a handicapped trail. It is quite remarkable, the access that is already in place, the infrastructure of our national parks. And as we passed under this place, we came to the second challenge the park is facing, which is not just access, it's water. For us, water was life. We could only carry one day's worth of water as we moved through this landscape. And when we came below the south rim, where all that infrastructure is above you, we come to this creek, Horn Creek, which you were advised by the Park Service, do not drink, do not touch, because it's contaminated. It's radioactive. It's a bit bizarre to hear when you're in a national park, perhaps our most iconic national park. The reason is there's a history of uranium mining around Grand Canyon National Park on the north, and the south. There's currently a 20-year ban. Some people want to lift that ban on new mining. Others want to make it permanent. They did a study not too long ago where they actually put blue dye in the water in seeps not far from this mine on the north rim, trying to understand the water table and the complexity of it and where it goes. To their amazement, they expected it to run downstream, appear below in the mileage of where this mine is. It appeared 26 miles upstream at North Canyon, 3,000 feet lower. And it goes to show the matrix and complexity of a water table we don't fully understand. These oases that burble out of the rocks are truly remarkable, and they just emerge. And they're some of the most stunning and rich support systems for a wide range of biodiversity. This water, of course, supplies the Colorado River, which supplies drinking water for 40 million Americans, and our salad bowl. If you like salad. It comes mostly from the Colorado River. The mining industry says they're doing everything by the book. We need clean energy. It's the best uranium in the world right here. They're doing it right. People have been there a long time. The people of the blue-green water, as they're called, the Havasupai tribe, which used to live inside Grand Canyon National Park, they say they're living on the front lines of a contamination issue. They go out and frequently protest in front of Canyon Mine, an active mine, which acts at incidentally hit groundwater last year. Because they're afraid these springs, like the one they live on, Havasu Creek, which just pours out of the rock, will be contaminated and destroy their way of life. As fall descended into winter, our challenges with heat went away, and soon I faced a harder challenge for me as a photographer and a filmmaker. The temperatures dropped down to four degrees, then minus eight degrees, we would huddle around our little stove. I would go to bed. I would keep my batteries on my armpits. I had one solar panel. Everything was lightweight. How could I keep documenting this place in these frozen conditions? And then remarkably, thinking we were going to pass through winter unscathed, it snowed a foot. It's beautiful. But when you're walking through this landscape 3,000 feet above the river, this is horrifying. We were in sneakers. We weren't prepared for snow. The photographer in me actually loved it, because it created a different layer cake, a different tapestry of hues and colors. I could tell my editor that I was seeing something other than maroon. And so I wanted to linger and photograph as much as I could, but we had to keep moving to stay ahead of the temperatures coming in spring. And soon, the winter melted into spring, and Kevin and I moved out into the western portion of the landscape. At which point, Kevin, who had been reluctant and miserable through most of this, more than I, he started to find greater strength and inspiration. And he really started charging into what they call the Godscape, the far west side, which few people go to. When I looked out into this landscape, I was like, oh, geez. I think I'm done. I ha figured I'd had enough images of this place. And I really didn't want to keep going. 
I was worried about water. I was worried about a lot of things. And then I found a little bit of inspiration from the great American philosopher, Evil Knievel, <laughs> who said, you can't say you're going to go jump the Grand Canyon and then quit or do another canyon. So I figured we'd better keep going. And we wanted to keep going as well because another challenge has evolved and blossomed out in the western side of the canyon is in the far reaches. And it is this dance between conservation and access that is playing out in the far west. It's a place called Helicopter Alley, which we were told, don't bother going through, there's nothing to see. An air tour industry boom has happened here. It didn't exist when I was a kid. Uh, today, it is one of the busiest helicopter ports in the world. I went and documented what one day of traffic looks like on an idle Tuesday. This is a photographic merge that shows Grand Canyon National Park in the western side, right on its border, of what one day of traffic looks like. I took a picture every time a helicopter crossed my lens, and then I sewed them together. On average, you might see 16 helicopters in the air, uh, but usually uh, you don't see all of these in the air at one time. But I wanted to show what the soundscape looks like. I'm actually a pilot. I do a lot of filming from aircraft, from helicopters. I'm not against this, but I'm trying to highlight how do we strike a balance with things like this. And as you move through this landscape, landscape we were told isn't that interesting, we found the opposite. The ramparts are bigger and steeper. The ancient Puebloan roots are more pronounced. The slot canyons are deeper and more polished. And every minute that we spent out in the far, far west, from dawn until this point in the evening at dusk, we heard the consistent echo and drone of turbine engines, of helicopters, which we hadn't heard anywhere else. And then on a Wednesday in November, my good friend Kevin and I stepped across the northwest corner of National Park, Grand Canyon National Park, which goes to show how remote it is because the only thing delineating this border are three metal posts slammed into the dirt. This step for us represented 13 months, eight trips stretched over that period, 750 miles, eight pairs of shoes, four sprained ankles, two broken fingers, a case of hypernatremia, thousands of cactus injuries, one heart surgery, one ankle surgery, the list goes on, two girlfriends, but it wasn't about us conquering this place. You can't conquer Grand Canyon National Park in a lifetime, in five lifetimes. It was about understanding this jewel of a landscape that we actually all share and are so fortunate to share. It actually has a wider range of biodiversity than any other national park in the United States. There were 1,700 species of vascular plants. There were 650 wildflower species. There are 450 birds that live inside the canyon, of which some of them, during the winter months, do not migrate. They just decide to pop down a few hundred million layers of geologic time inside the canyon. There are 47 reptiles and 22 bats. It is a remarkable place. And it is remarkable how, when you get into a landscape like this, a national park, any national park, how it helps us connect. Kevin and I are still friends. We're, in fact, great friends. Friendship is what got us through this. And as the late author Ed Abbey once said, you have to walk, better yet crawl, on hands and knees over the sandstone, through the thornbrush and the cactus. And when traces of blood start to mark your trail, then you will see something, maybe. <laughs> so what did we see? Again, this was a way to shine a light on this remarkable place. And we've come away with three lessons, I think, that changed us. Kevin actually describes them as gifts. The first one is this. When we think of our national parks, and specifically Grand Canyon National Park, we often define them in visual language. We think of them in color and light and texture. But for me and for Kevin, the one thing that sticks with us the most is not the visual, it's defined by the auditory. It is the deep and profound silence that hangs over this landscape that is so profound 
My microphones on my cameras would often buzz because they're calibrated to a noisier silence. And it is silence not void of sound. In fact, it is rich in sound. It is just sounds we often don't hear or have forgotten they exist. I would frequently awake to the wisp of bat wings over my head in the morning as they were out hunting for bugs. Or as we were hiking, I would often hear the distant clatter of a sheep and think it was nearby, and then I would later realize, looking around, that that sheep was on the other side of the canyon, miles from me. And that deep, deep liquid silence, as I call it, is so remarkably fragile, mainly by the machines and the ways that we come and visit our places. Equally as fragile is this, and it happened every single day it was Kevin's favorite time because we stopped walking. <laughs> but it was when the hot light would turn cool and it would shift into these emerald hues and we would often be 3,000 feet above the river again because the river was too complicated to walk next to it. But you hear down below you that lifeline of the southwest, the Colorado River rumbling below you. And then as night shifts and the light fades away, you realize there's a second river, a river of stars that sweeps over your head every single night and is truly, truly magical. And when you're in that space, you realize you're sort of suspended in the hand of the canyon between the river below you and the river above you. And if we step up and the help of NASA, we start to understand why this is unique and how lucky we are to still have places like this because light pollution is sweeping across the entire country, the entire planet. And if you look over in the left side of the frame, you can see that one canyon visible from outer space. And when you're in that space, it is truly magical. gift or lesson is this. When we look into this place, which many Americans do, uh, the average is seven minutes on the rim, incidentally, we often think of a place that's empty. There's nothing there. You come and look, and they're like, wow, that's big. Well, let's go, honey. <laughs> There's too much there there. But when you spend time there and give it just a, just a little more time, you realize it's not empty at all. It's full of life and biodiversity, and then throughout it, it's rich in rich in carpets of archaeology, tools of the people that came before us, the ancient Puebloans that have places where they stored their food, you can see on the right side of that frame, and in certain secret spots that we don't reveal, their artwork, where they left the footprint of their work. This artwork dates back 4,000 years, some say 10,000 years old. And then you wonder, well, where did all these people go? What happened to them? And you also realize that they're still here as well. There are 11 Native American tribes that live in and around Grand Canyon National Park. And they are standing on the precipice of this place, trying to understand how to balance economics and conservation. And of course, we should include their voice as we, as the American public, move these landscapes, protected landscapes, shared landscapes, from one generation to the next. And to give you an idea how powerful their voice can be, let me take you back to Renee Yellowhorse. She and her band of 12 Navajo grannies, of which again, four speak English, they went in front of the Navajo Council after gaining 80,000 signatures and were able to turn this billion dollar development proposal, or at least halt it in its tracks temporarily in a vote 16 to two last year. And so it raises the question, 
How do we see this landscape? Do we see it as something to check off our bucket list? Something to just fill our social media up with and add to our amusement that already exists in America? Or is it something more? Is it sacred? Is it a place, if we leave it as it is, is it actually more valuable as a living classroom that's soaked in silence and shrouded in starlight that offers us places to learn about biodiversity, geology, archaeology, and perhaps the most important of all, humility. As a photographer and a filmmaker, all I can do is showcase what this place is to try to help the American public realize how lucky we are to have it. Because I do only know one thing here, and that is we already have 400 amusement parks across the United States, but we have only one place that looks and sounds like this. Thank you very much. Thank you.